this is the hardware for the DFC. On the far side here, we've got a compressed nitrogen tank, just like with all of the tanks in the lab. The right side of the gauge shows the pressure inside the tank. The left side of the gauge shows the pressure coming out of the tank. There's never any need to mess with the regulator, so that knob there in the front. You'll just need to open and close the tank by pressing or by rotating the silver knob on top. Next to it is a dewer of liquid nitrogen. The liquid nitrogen serves to cool down the DFC. It is pressurized using the compressed gaseous nitrogen next to it. Um, and then the nitrogen, the, the uh, liquid nitrogen, flows through the DFC. This is the DFC right here. We have an auto sampler on top, meaning we can do up to about 19 or 20 samples without you having to babysit the machine. They'll automatically put them in and take them out. The DFC has nitrogen flowing through it, so the liquid nitrogen to cool it, but also the gaseous nitrogen, which serves to create an inert atmosphere around your sample. Inside, you've got two spots for a sample. You've got space for a reference crucible, which is usually empty, and a sample crucible, which is usually full, unless you are running a correction scan, which is also called a baseline, which, in which case you have two empties next to each other. The DSC needs at least one hour to warm up, which allows the electronics to come to a nice equilibrium inside, uh, at which point you're allowed to start running your scans. This right here is the sample card. Um, this is for the auto sampler. What it does is it holds zero, or a reference space right here, all the way up to 19 different samples. Um, we're gonna take this over to the sample prep area and we're going to put our crucibles onto it and then bring it back and place it back here on the auto sampler like that. So this is where we sample prep right here. We've got our little sample card right here from the auto sampler. Inside this wooden box here are all of the pieces we're going to need. These two right here are samples that I use for calibration. We calibrate approximately every six months or so. Um, that's not anything you're going to have to like worry about, but those are those, so we'll just leave those there. Here on the side though, we've got two containers. The orange container is the lids. This white container is our crucibles. So we're going to pull out one lid and one crucible. In the drawer directly underneath us, we've got a whole bunch of tweezers and things. I'm going to grab one crucible and one lid. The thing about these is these are basically just aluminum foil. Um, they're really, really easy to bend. They're very, very thin. So you want to be really careful as you're picking them up, them up that you're being very gentle. Um, I have bent many of these crucibles before. The lid goes like this, like a top hat, and will sit on the crucible. You can see it kind of sits down inside that little lip right there. We are going to weigh our crucible so that we get an empty weight. Most of these crucibles weigh approximately 39 to 40 milligrams. Hey, hey, on the dot. So what you do is you record the weight, 40.4 milligrams on this. Um, our scale is not quite precise in that very last digit. Uh, it tends to fluctuate a little bit because of air currents and static, um, but 40.4 seems to be about where it's trying to like settle. Um, so I would record this as the empty weight of this crucible. At this point, we would put our material in the crucible, unless we were preparing this to be a correction or an empty crucible. In the DSC, we can do any number of types of samples, the most common being liquid pellets or some sort of solid, and then powders. Um, as long as your pellets can fit into the crucible and we can put the lid on it, we have no problem with those. Um, if you have something too large, it tends to be better to powder it down. 
the reason why powders tend to be a little better than pellets, if possible, is because of the difference between kinetics and thermodynamics. When we have a big chunk of material, the kinetics of the melting, let's say, are going to make it seem like in the DSC the melting happens at a different temperature than it truly does. Because a large pellet is going to take a lot more energy and a lot more time to melt down. A powder is going to react a little bit more spontaneously to the temperature changes because of the higher surface area and less just sort of like agglomeration going on in there. If possible, powders are going to give you a slightly more accurate result, um, but sometimes you're interested in how the pellet does um, you know, play into the melting. Sometimes you're interested in the kinetics. So it's just something to be aware of when you're working with solids. With liquids, um, pretty much everything's gonna react almost exactly what it should. Kinetics are not as big a deal with liquids. So let's say we've got a pellet material. This is a polymer. I'm gonna grab one of these, just in a tiny little pellet form right here. You can see it's mostly cylindrical, but it does have a sort of flat spot on the side of it. And what we're gonna do is we're going to place the flat side down inside the crucible. The reason for that oh, is twofold. The heat comes from below, so to make sure that our sample is being heated as uniformly as possible, we're going to make sure that the flat spot's down. Also, the DSC sensor is on the bottom plate. So making sure that we have good contact between the sample and the crucible and the sensor is going to mean that we have the most accurate data. So what we would do, what I would likely do is zero out the weight of the crucible, but you can also do the math on it if you prefer. And I'm just gonna place my pellet right in there. You can see my pellet is small enough that it's not sticking out above the lip of the crucible. So you want to make sure that it's going to sit down in there. And when I put the lid on top, we want to make sure that it's not going to deform the lid to try to like set the lid all the way in there. For a powder, again, I'm going to zero out the weight of the crucible. In order to make sure that we're not getting our scale really dirty though, I'm going to pull the crucible out to place the material in there. We have Kim wipes and whey papers, just kind of around the lab that you can use to kind of catch any spill that you might have. When we're working with powders, especially ones that we expect to melt or evaporate in the DSC, you wanna fill it no higher than halfway. Ideally, you would just put enough to kind of cover the bottom of the crucible. get a decent idea of how much material that is for yours. Um, around 10 milligrams is what is traditional for a DSC as far as the amount of material to have, but if you have a really dense or a really fluffy material that's going to vary somewhat. But then I'm really carefully just going to set that right back on the scale and I've got about 13 milligrams here. So I would record the mass of the material that I put in there. Same as with a liquid, you want to make sure that you're not going to accidentally spill any liquid on the scale here. So you pull it out, fill it up. Again, with liquids, make sure not to fill more than like halfway of the crucible. You want to make sure that you have a pretty low amount in there so that if it does boil up or boil over, that we don't have any contamination on the inside of the DSC itself. Any questions? One last little thing we'll do before closing this crucible, what we're gonna do is uh, crimp it closed so that we don't have to worry about the lid flying off as we're transporting it from place to place. Um, we're going to, or I guess you get to choose whether you poke a hole in the lid or not. There are a couple of reasons why you might want to poke a hole in the lid, and I've got a couple of examples here. This little container, you can't really see it very well, it says sealed references here on the top. These references are just empty crucibles that people in the past have used. 
and then we keep them so that we can use them as a reference or as a baseline. There are two different styles of kind of poking the lid. This one you can see is poked through the middle and this one is poked on the side. Um, there's not a functional difference between them other than your personal preference really. Um, like I mentioned, there are a couple of reasons why you may want to poke a hole in the crucible or not. Um, one reason is these crucibles do not hold pressure. If any sort of burn off or evaporation is going to happen to your sample, there needs to be a hole, otherwise the crucible will burst open. Um, oftentimes that flings the crucible off the sensor and the rest of your data is useless. Um, so by having that hole, it allows for pressure to fluctuate inside of the crucible without any negative consequences on your results. Um, another reason to have the hole poked in the top is to allow nitrogen, which is our inert gas that flows through the DSC at all times, to flow into and out of your crucible. That's going to allow your sample to have a nice uniform atmosphere while it's running, rather than having a little bit of air and a little bit of carbon dioxide or whatever was in the air at the time that you prepared the crucible. Um, so those are two reasons you might want to have that hole poked in there. Um, it's entirely up to you. Some people don't poke a hole at all because they're not expecting any change in the, you know, they're not expecting any evaporation and maybe they just don't want to put in the effort of poking the hole in the lid. So that's entirely up to you. If you choose to poke a hole in the lid, you want to make sure that every sample is the exact same as the reference. So if you choose this reference right here with the hole poked in the middle, you want to make sure that our hole in our crucible is poked downward and right in the middle. Back in the wooden container here, we've got some push pins, real scientific here. And you would poke the lid just facing straight down. Once you have whatever hole you want poked in the lid or not poked in the lid, you're going to use the tweezers, place the lid on top, Make sure that it's nice and centered and that it's sitting down on the pan rather than kind of floating up on top of anything. And we're going to transport the crucible over to this crimping machine right here. You'll put it on and then grab this black knob and press down. So you'll press down and it'll press down to about two fingers distance from the base here. When we lift this up, the lid is now attached. Um, it's sort of been crimped over. So if you accidentally flip the, can the container upside down, you don't have to worry about spilling your material. The problem here is every single crucible is going to look the exact same. For that reason, it's really important that you write down the crucible weight and the sample weight. So if you accidentally mix two up, you can stick them back on the scale and hopefully kind of figure out which one is which. Once you're happy with this, we're gonna put it in whatever location on the sample card here. Make sure that you have a valid reference. So I would put my reference here. And if necessary, make sure that you have a correction as well. So these are two empty crucibles right here. And then this is our sample crucible that we just prepared. These two empties are going to be used to run our correction before we run our sample to help even out the baseline and negate any noise that might be coming into the machine from the room, etc. We're going to repeat this process for as many samples as we have and then take the card back to the machine. So at this point, the DSC has been turned on for at least an hour before you want to sit down and start on the actual scan itself. Um, you can tell that it's turned on because it's got the little blue power button lit there. The on button is around the back side. Because it needs an hour to warm up, the earliest you can schedule it during the day is 10 o'clock. Um, you're all definitely welcome to come in at 9 o'clock when we open to start prepping your samples. Um, but I wouldn't recommend actually starting the machine on the run until about 10 o'clock. Um, also because it requires an hour to warm up, 
one hour before your scheduled time, it is recommended to come into the lab or to call the lab to make sure that it gets turned on in anticipation of your arrival at the beginning of your time. So it's going to be typically in a closed position as far as the auto sampler is concerned. We've got the machine turned on. Um, I have double checked that there's liquid nitrogen in the container. The best way to check, the best way to check that there's liquid nitrogen in the container is to release the two brakes at the bottom and to shake it and then release. If this is full, there would be a little bit of sloshing. So this is actually empty right now. Because this is empty, as the client, you would just request that one of the lab staff fill this up for you and we'll take care of that. The other thing you want to check before you actually start the scan is that you have enough gas and that the gas is turned on. You can see we have a little under 500 PSI. Um, that means that this tank is pretty close to empty, so I'll order a new one. If you notice that it's below 500 PSI, just let staff know and we'll order a new one. This will be just fine though for another day or two of scans. So now that I know that my hardware is all set up, the machine's been warming up for an hour, I have enough compressed nitrogen, I have a good full to doer of liquid nitrogen, and I have all of my samples on the auto sampler card. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into the software. It is called DSC 3500 Sirius right here. It's also on the main bar down at the bottom. And what the first thing it's gonna do is try to connect to the instrument. Um, looks like we've got an update here and I will update that shortly. Thank you. It's also going to offer to turn on the set point. The purpose of the set point is to hold the machine at a uniform temperature as long as the software is open. That temperature is going to be 25 degrees per uh, 25 degrees Celsius. Um, the good and the bad thing about this is what it's going to do is it's going to automatically flow the liquid nitrogen and it's going to turn on the furnace. So they're going to be constantly kind of battling it out. That's good because it keeps a nice uniform temperature. It makes sure that the liquid nitrogen and the furnace are both primed and ready to use. Um, the problem is, is it kind of wastes the liquid nitrogen if it's left on and not being used actively. So you want to make sure that you only turn on the software when you're ready to run and when the run is done that you turn off the software again so we don't just have it running with nitrogen all day long. But we're going to say yes, we want to start the set point and you will hear it um, usually within the first couple minutes start to run the liquid nitrogen and it's just a little hissing sound. You'll see a little bit of vapor escape from the DSC on the side next to the uh, liquid nitrogen. Um, but you can kind of hear and you'll hear a little bit of that liquid nitrogen battling it out with the furnace and that's going to be going as long as the software is on. So we'll try to get through this quickly so we don't lose our minds. The first thing we're going to do, if you haven't done this already, is we're going to create a method. To create a new method, we're going to click method, create new method. This is the method dialog box right here. This first page just tells us about the hardware that is installed in the instrument right now. Our current temperature range is from negative 170 degrees Celsius up to 600 degrees Celsius. At the extremities of that range, we have some issues. It can't quite cool down to negative 170 without working really, really hard. So the cooling ability slows down. It's not able to cool at such a fast rate. And up near 600, um, that over time is going to wear out the furnace. So we tend to stop around 500 degrees Celsius rather than going up to the full range. So the functional range of this is more like negative 140 up to 500. Technically it has the extremities of that range if you really, really need it, um, but we do struggle a little bit in those. There's nothing on this page that you need to change, so we can just click right to the next tab. So this is the header. This is just kind of information about what you're doing. We have two options of method type. You can run a sample or a correction plus sample. 
A sample is an uncorrected sample. Um, it's pretty much always recommended to run a correction plus a sample. As with everything in science, there's always a trade-off between the length of time that you take to do something and the resolution of data that you're going to get. A correction plus a sample requires running a zero scan before you start your sample, meaning you run two empty crucibles at the exact temperature program that you're using for your samples. This zero scan or this correction is valid for about one week. You can use it over and over and over again but at the end of that week, you're gonna to need to run another zero scan. If you just need quick results, you can run just a sample. However, that's going to give you a little bit more noise in the final result, and it might be harder to see phase changes that are a little smaller. So I would always recommend doing a correction plus sample as long as you have the means to do so. You can also put in some optional information here about the laboratory, the project, who you are running it. You can put sample mass constraints. The average sample is really only going to weigh about 10 milligrams, but you can put in constraints if that's something that applies to your project. You don't need to mess with anything here. These are the gases flowing. You can see it says nitrogen on purge two and protective. So we just have nitrogen flowing over two different portions of the machine. Um, the purge gas is through the sample chamber. The protective is over the furnace, but you don't need to change those. Those are just set to our default. Next, we'll move on to the temperature program. This is where we're going to set up the exact method parameters. So this is where we're going to say we start at room temperature, we heat up or cool down, we can hold it for a certain length of time, etc. The first thing we're going to do is click purge to and protective. It's important that you click that at the very beginning so that it runs through the entirety of the test. If you have your nitrogen turning on and off, not only can it cause issues for your sample because you've got some air and some nitrogen, but it also can potentially damage our furnace um, if we don't have that nice protective gas flowing over it through the entirety of the test. So turn on purge two and protective. Our start temperature, room temperature tends to be around 20 degrees Celsius. I mentioned our set point is holding the machine at 25 degrees Celsius. So our start temperature is gonna be anywhere between 20 and 25 degrees. You can set that as you desire. And we'll click add right here. Next, we're going to put in dynamic and isothermal steps. A dynamic step is something that's changing over time. So that would be temperature per time. Um, like I said, our traditional for DSC is going to be 10 degrees per minute. So you put in your end temperature. Um, Typically, that would come from knowing where your phase change is happening. If we are doing a polymer pellet, and we know that we expect a melting temperature around 170 degrees, then we would want to heat up to 200 or maybe even a little higher. So you want to be about 20 to 50 degrees higher than your phase change to make sure that the phase change isn't in the middle of happening when you turn around and start cooling down. So I would say my end temperature would be about 200 heating rate would be 10 degrees per minute, and these other two will autofill. So I'm gonna add that dynamic step. You can see it added to our table here at the top. And I can add dynamic and isothermal, isothermal being a hold. So now that I'm at 100 degrees, I wanna hold for zero, zero, 15 minutes, and I can click add. So now it's gonna ramp up to 200, and then hold at 200 for 15 minutes. And then I can start cooling down by adding another dynamic and giving it my end temperature of room temperature. Now it's a cooling rate. Again, 10 degrees per minute is what's recommended. And we're back down to room temperature in the method. So what we did is we heated up to 200, held for 15 minutes, and cooled back down. If this is all you want to do, we can add the final step. If there is more that you want to do, you can keep adding dynamic and isothermal steps. The only thing to keep in mind is you want your last step to take you back to room temperature. That's pretty much the only thing that needs to happen is last step takes you back to room temperature or whatever your starting temperature was. When you have gone back to your starting temperature, we're going to click final and click add. 
That final temperature is going to add an emergency stop just in case the furnace doesn't stop heating up. It's going to cut the power so that we don't accidentally get like a furnace meltdown on our hands. So that's just an emergency step. You don't have to do anything with it. Once you've added that final step, you can see down in this corner the total time right here. This is a 50 minute scan just about. Um, and we're going to get, it looks like, 11,000 data points from this scan. Heating up, holding, cooling down. The final tab is calibrations. You want to select the calibrations will be used. We have a temperature calibration, which is going to calibrate your x-axis, essentially, and a heat flow calibration that's going to calibrate your y-axis, essentially. You want to click will be used for all of them. We currently only have one active uh, calibration in here. Over time, we will get more of them, but because this is brand new software, we've only run one calibration since it was installed. What you want to choose is something that runs your heating rate, has your same temperature range, or is bigger than your temperature range. And you want to make sure that you're using the most recent calibration that fits those criteria. Typically, we're always we're pretty much always going to have 10 degrees per minute, and we're gonna run the full temperature range of the machine. Um, but it is possible that someone will come in and request a specialized calibration. Just make sure that you're selecting the calibration that matches what you want to run. So we will use the most recent temperature calibration and the most recent sensitivity calibration. And now you can see we've got all green up on the top tabs, and we're gonna click OK. Last little thing is it will give us a nice kind of a visual of what our temperature is gonna do. It's gonna heat up, cold, and then cool back down. It is going to save to uh, the Netch folder, which is just a local folder here on the computer, so that the software can keep track of whether you have an active calibration or not. The software will keep track of that for you. So we'll just click save. You can also click save as if you want to save a copy of this method to your own folder somewhere else. Um, that can be helpful if you plan on modifying it later or you want to export the parameters or something. You can click save as to save it to a different location as well. We're just gonna save it. Um, we're going to give it some sort of a name. And I'm gonna name this RT for room temperature to 200 with 15 minute hold. Um, just kind of as generic as I can with this one. You can save whatever is useful to your project. So you can save it by a batch name if that's more useful to your project or whatever, you know, whatever works. Once we have the method or methods set up as we wish, we're going to click on auto sampler on the top menu and start auto sampler mode. That's going to ask if you want to load the last auto sampler setup or if you want to start your new auto sampler setup. Because you are not the same last client, we're going to start a new definition. So we're going to click no. We want to not load the last one. We're going to start a new one. And click start. And what this is going to do is give us this dialog box. It starts with zero. It says position zero here. We've got position one, two, three, all the way up to 19. This mimics the sample card that sits on the auto sample. Position zero is always set up to be a reference. We've got a center pierce, alumina cruci aluminum, sorry, aluminum crucible. That's pretty much always going to sit on position zero. So that's typically set up to be that way. Um, you're welcome to change that reference if you want your reference to be something different, but usually that's where the reference sits on sample zero. Position one is where you would typically put your correction or your empty crucible. To do that, we're going to click on position one and we're going to click define step. If you wanted to add a secondary reference, you could also add reference. We're going to click define step and we're going to select the method that we're going to use. Room temperature to 200 with 15 minute hold is the name of this one. You can see it was last used never because I just made it. 
and we're going to open whatever method you wish to use. It's going to give us this dialog box that allows us to put in the sample specific information. So before we were just putting in the method, which was just the parameters of the scan itself, now it's going to allow us to put in the sample information. Because I specified this as a correction plus sample, it is going to force me to run a correction first. You can see in red it says baseline must be performed first. So this is going to be an empty crucible. And you can see I cannot type in the mass section, it's kind of grayed out. So what I would do is just put in an identity and a name. And identity is going to be something unique, such as the date, so 2, 16, 21, um, empty. Name would be something like baseline or correction. Something that's a little less unique, but still describes your sample. You can choose which reference to run with it. We only have one valid reference right now, so there's nothing to put in, but you can. You can also put in optional information about the laboratory, the project, the operator, etc. And then if you'd like, you can store the file in a different location by selecting this box. It'll automatically store the baseline to its own folders, um, but if you'd like it to save also to your own folder so that you have the baseline, you're welcome to. It will auto subtract the baseline as it runs, so you don't have to have the baseline, but some people like to look at it to verify that everything works smoothly. Once we're happy with all of this, we'll click add down in the bottom corner. And you can see we've got a yellow and it's got an empty crucible uh, shape right here. On my next position, I'm gonna do the same thing. Define step, select the method that I'm using, only now, because I have a correction in an earlier position, I can choose to run a correction or a correction plus sample. This means that this is a sample and I can choose to put in a mass. Um, the mass of my powder was about 13 milligrams. Traditionally, it'll be about 10 milligrams. And again, we put in an identity and a name. Finally, this one you have to tell it where to save. So this one does not save automatically to the Netch folder. This one you have to tell it where to save. Clicking select, we've got desktop, user data short shortcut, and find your folder in here. So we'll find mine. temperature to 200 and add. So now you can see we've got a different symbol here, meaning that there is a sample in that position as opposed to a correction with an empty crystal. If you want to run multiple methods on the same sample cup or the same crucible, you can select the position again and click define step a second time. This would allow us to select another method, say room temperature maybe to 100, and it would open the same dialog box, and then add. Now you can see position one has one run connected, position two has two runs connected. So what it will do is run position one as your correction, and then it will run position two and then it will run position two a second time with the two different methods that I've selected on that location. If you need to delete any of these runs, you would come to the execution list tab. There are three tabs along the top. You select whichever run you want to delete. So we can see this one is the room temperature to 200. Here's the room temperature to 100. And I can remove that step. Yes, I want to remove that step. So now I just have the one run on position two rather than the two runs on position two that I had previously. You can do as many runs on as many locations as you want all the way up to position number 19. 
at the end, it will give you an estimated length of time for the entire cart to run. That's not the exact length of time that it will take because there is a little bit of equilibration time between each crucible where it takes two or three minutes or so for it to make sure that everything's looking right, make sure it double checks the gas flow and the temperature signals to make sure everything's working properly. But right now, my one correction and my one sample will take about an hour and 42 minutes. A little longer than that by maybe five minutes or so. Once I have hit start, it's going to give me one last little dialog box to allow me to check to make sure that what it believes is true. It right now believes the furnace is closed, there's no sample in the furnace, and there's no reference in the furnace. I know that all of those are true, but I can open and close the furnace to double check. So I'm going to click open the furnace. You can see the auto sampler pulls the lid up and off at which point you can check inside the furnace to make sure that there is no crucible in there. Would you, no, would you like look inside there? You can see there are two locations, two little sensors for those pans. Both are empty. We have no crucible in there. So what I can do is click OK and tell it I'm good. If there was something in there that the um, auto sampler didn't know about, I'd want to make sure that I removed it. And if there were crucibles in there that the auto sampler knew about, I would ask it to take the sample out. But everything looks good here. I'm going to click OK. While the test is running, you can close or minimize the auto sample tray view and you'll be able to see the data collecting in real time. The red line shows the temperature of the instrument, the blue line shows the uh, DFC response, and up in the top you will see a timer on how long the current test will take. As the various auto sample tests finish, you'll see color changes along this auto sample tray at the top. Blue means actively running, and it will turn into a green color once it is finished. Once your analysis is completed, you're going to go back to the desktop and open up Proteus Analysis. And we're going to open up using the open button up in the top left. We're gonna open up just some liquid water that we ran down below freezing and kind of through melting. So you can see we ran four cycles, or three cycles of this, I apologize. Um, we have our cooling and then heating and then cooling, heating, cooling, heating, back to room temperature. And you can see these are freezing and these are melting events happening there. The first thing that you're typically going to want to do is export the raw data. This is if you want to graph it yourself uh, using MATLAB or Excel or something like that and you want to export just the raw X, Y, uh, you know, Excel format kind of data. You're going to go to Extras. You're going to click on Export Data. And using these black lines, you can determine what region you're most interested in. Typically, when you do several cycles, it will be the third or the fourth cycle that you'd be most interested in plotting to put on your poster or your, um, you know, in your publication. You can also select um, different regions here, whatever's most uh, important to you and your research. At that point, you can click export and it'll ask you where to save the results. You want to do that first because at the very beginning, this whole thing is all one individual, or not individual, it's one uh, whole piece. Um, rather than having pieces 
that are cut up into segments, this is all one scan. As we do analysis, it's required for us to cut this into segments and just look at individual heating, cooling, or isotherm segments. Um, and that's gonna make it a little harder to export the big sections of raw data that you might want. If you do wanna do some sort of analysis in this software here, typically the first thing you're gonna have to do is change the x-axis from time, which it is currently, to temperature. So we're going to click on this T over T yellow box up in the top. And you can see that has given us a cyclic pattern here because our temperature was cyclic up and back and up and back. The next thing we're gonna do is press the red and green check mark and X box right next to the T over T. This is going to show us all of the different segments that we have available and you can select which ones you wanna do. Usually if you're doing analysis um, on some repeated cycle, you would look at the second and third heating cycles. That's just typically what people tend to look at. I'm gonna look at just the last heating cycle. So I'm gonna hit okay. So this just shows my last heating cycle. We started down at negative 50 and we heated up to about 20 degrees Celsius or room temperature. When I have just one singular segment selected rather than several, you will see these blue in, uh, buttons right here illuminated, meaning that we can use them. These go all the way from derivatives, first and second derivatives. You can identify the area under the curve. You can identify onset, offset, glassy transition information, and a lot of other information that you might want to be pulling from a DSC curve. What I'm going to do is I'm going to identify the onset of this because I want to know when the melting started to happen. And I'm going to use these black lines to kind of highlight my area of interest. I'm going to stay on the flat baseline here. And on the right side, I'm going to go up to the peak of this event right here. So I'm going to click apply and then OK. And that will identify my onset for me. So my onset here is 0.8 degrees Celsius, which uh, is a little different from what you'd expect water to melt at. We do have a little bit of a delay, but really not much. So the next step then is potentially to export this nice graphic that I've made with whatever analysis that I've done. In this case, we're going to go to extras and we're going to click export graphic, where before we clicked export data, we're going to now click export graphic. You can choose what file format you are interested in using and you can click export and this will ask you to save it to a certain location. Once you have all of the exported data that you want and you've done all the analysis that you need, just like on any of our other machines, you will open up Chrome and you can email the data to yourself. Please do not log into your own personal email account, just use the lab's email account which will automatically be logged into when you open up Chrome. Once you're done with everything at the computer and at the machine, please make sure to clean up your samples off of the auto sample tray. Any samples left on the auto sample tray could be considered abandoned and you may be charged for their stay on the machine. The crucibles can just be thrown away. If your material is not safe to go in the municipal trash, you are responsible to take the crucibles with you, with the material inside of them, and dispose of them safely yourself. If they are safe to go into the municipal trash, you are welcome to just throw them in the trash here. Please make sure also to um, you know, clean up any mess from sample preparation and such that was left. Last thing before you leave, make sure to turn off the compressed nitrogen gas.